Well, welcome, Wyoming. This is our second special session during the month of March Madness, our online culture change conference for the Wyoming Culture Change Coalition. <laughs> That's a mouthful. My name is Carmen Bowman. It's been my privilege to get to work with you all in Wyoming and to be a part of this three-year grant. Uh, part of the three-year grant is to do um, a conference. And, you know, instead of in person, we're doing it online. We're all pretty used to that now. And so here we go. Thank you all for joining me. Today, I get to tell you a lot about something called culture change. And I personally really stick to those words. <laughs> I don't know why. I like them because institutional culture is a real thing. Culture is a real thing. And what we're trying to change is institutional culture. So just so you know, that's why that lingo is used. And believe it or not, sometimes people ask me, they kind of get confused with ethnicity <laughs> and, and like disparity, you know, and equality and all that's, you know, another topic. So we're not talking about that. We are talking about that institutional culture. And, you know, think about why people don't want to live in a nursing home, right? I believe it could be um, described as the institutional culture <laughs> is why they don't want to live there. So I want to share this beautiful quote with you all as part of our culture change movement. The culture change movement, by the way, is a real thing. <laughs> it's international and it's been around for going on 30 years. And so I'd really invite you to be a part of it. We need your help. Um, nursing homes can really be very different and it saddens me that they're not there yet and you can help us get there. So look at this beautiful quote from a leader in our movement. No longer are the needs of the institution going to come before the needs of the individual. Like, wouldn't you want to live in a place like that? And it tends to be the opposite, right? The institutional schedule <laughs> comes first. It is time for your bath right now. If you don't want it, too bad. Now you got to wait till the next one. See, we're trying to reverse that. Believe it or not, in some homes, it would be more like this. Hey, Dawn, um, we do have, you know, in the schedule, bath for you now, but does that work for you? <laughs> and then ideally, you know, we go with either one. Either answer is okay. Now, great. Later, fine. I'll go pick someone up. I'll go talk to someone else. You know, the institution makes it feel like you can't do that. Everything's on a schedule and it cannot budge. Well, of course it can budge because homes have done it. And I love getting to tell you all that. One way to think of everything, here's two other words. I'm sorry they're not on the slide, is redesigned work. Guess what? You're still going to help everyone get a bath but it can be redesigned according to the people who live there. Uh, we have something called um, personalized med pass. Guess what? Meds can be given on a more open schedule. It's called a personalized. It, it's like thinking about windows instead of it must be given right this minute. So for instance, we do meds upon rising. Isn't that beautiful? And then that supports sleep. We don't wake people up because sleep is actually healthy. <laughs> Imagine that. Well, I'll talk more about sleep in a minute, but my point here is notice that if we honor people's own sleeping rhythms, some people wake up early, some people wake up late and everyone else wakes up in the middle. And so we redesign the work. We're still gonna help everyone get up and everyone get dressed, but we do it according to their schedule and their routine. And something else I'd love to just pass on to you all from a colleague that I know, uh, he points out, like he thinks of the pendulum. He says, everybody, let's just keep moving the pendulum away from institution. And if you have to go to home like first, fine, but we really wanna go past home like, and we wanna get to home. That's my challenge to all of you listening. How can you help us get to true home? Not even home like. You know, that's words that are used in this business. They're in the regs and the culture change movement is way past that word already. So some more about culture change. Um, I tend to say culture change holds all the answers to all the outcomes that we all want. Look at this. When you change institutional culture, people actually want to live there. So then typically a nursing home has more people, even let's say if they're full, Let's just get this out of the way. The nursing home makes the money that it hopes to make, right? 
It's not all about that. We know that, but it is a, a win. Then when you give this more individualized um, routines, when you honor the individual's routines, it ends up being more efficient. See, if we make someone wake up and we make them get out of bed and they don't want to, that's an example of inefficient work, right? Because you're fighting against each other. You don't mean to, but it is. And so when you do things that match the person, it's more efficient and it represents a savings of money. Um, same thing when you give people the food they want to eat in an amount they want to eat, it's proven you will save money because you're not making food that gets wasted. And then think of the people who work there. They tend to like to work in these situations, right? In these cultures. Once in a while, believe it or not, over all these years, <laughs> I've heard of people who say, phooey on culture change. I'm going down the street to the institutional nursing home to work. Well, okay. <laughs> Isn't that something? But most people love it. It speaks to our hearts. It's more natural and normal, right? And so then, of course, if you retain your staff, you're saving money. And better yet, we have continuity of care for the people that we're serving. And then we have better satisfaction by everybody. We have fewer problems. We have fewer calls to the ombudsman. We have fewer complaints internally, fewer complaints to the health department. Um, real food is, is a theme of our movement, right? Unfortunately, in this business, okay, the business of caring for older, maybe frailer, sicker people, when they start to lose weight, we tend to slap on, let's say, the supplements. And to be honest, supplements are not real food. Um, certainly some people like them fine, but to be honest, um, we know that most people don't drink the whole thing. So think about all the money being wasted with this kind of fake food that people don't like. How many of you have ever tasted it or I can't even get past the smell. <laughs> it smells like vitamins, right? And then, so there's an example of that's an institutional practice that, that wastes money. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you guys to unmute since there's not a big group, okay? How many of you like malts? Tell me. Versus, oh, sorry. Okay, versus ice cream um, shakes versus smoothies. What's your favorite, Patty? Oh, my favorite is what I call a ice cream chocolate milk float. Oh my, cool. So you take chocolate milk and then you put in a couple of scoops of vanilla ice cream. And there's something about the cold from the ice cream that mixes with the chocolate milk and it's just wonderful. But oh, second, boy. I guess second would be milkshakes. Awesome. Um, Kelly, what's yours? I like this fruit smoothie. Smoothies. Okay. How about um, Jesse? I'd have to say chocolate milkshake. Mm, okay. And, <laughs> and Brittany, did you already answer? I missed it. Uh, I will take a chocolate malt any day of the week. <laughs> Brittany, we think a lot alike. And Dawn? Yes, ma'am, we do. Movie. A smoothie. And one no, more, Jill. Movie. movie. But my Is question. Is that one of the options? Movie? Dawn. <laughs> it's do you like malts or shakes or smoothies? Uh, smoothies. Okay. Is that your no, answer? No, no. I, I like, I like malts. <laughs> I like okay. Malt. Okay. Me too. And Jill, malts how about you? Movie. I have to go with cookie dough blizzards. Uh, D. Oh, wow. <laughs> she's adding, she's adding. An <laughs> Jill, you're so fun. Okay. So here's my point. Wouldn't you rather have that, whatever you just said, compared to an insurer? No offense, insurer. Anybody? Yeah. Anybody? Or is it just yeah. me? And watch this, everybody. See, this is so funny to me. Ready? At the end of the malt, this is the sound I hear. How about you? And I'm very sad at that point because it's over. Anyone else? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but you yes. don't hear that. You don't hear that with the insurer so much. So proves our point, right? Now, here's another fun thing regarding our movement. That is um, inviting people of all ages into the movement. Now, of course, we all want this, love this, but we need more of it, to be honest. Our movement stands for just bringing real life back to people. So real life consists of uh, people of all ages, right? Mid, mid ages, young ages, children, babies, toddlers, bring them, bring them on, right? 
And my daughter is in the photo here at age 12. And we, we got to do a grant in Colorado where we did youth day camps. So they're only there in the day. Youth, about eight to 13. She was 12. And that is Maya, who just followed us around all day. Look at Maya. And look at what Maya said at our closing celebration. The children brought my happiness back. My depression is gone. I stopped my medication today. Do you realize, everyone, we do not hear that usually about the things we do do in the nursing home, you know? So you don't hear with from Zoloft, it brought my happiness back <laughs> so much, you know? And I got another fun example coming up. So um, let's see. So while I'm thinking about kids and babies right here and kids, notice I'm trying to say people of all ages. It's not just about kids. It's not just about babies. It's not just about high school. Older adults need all of us, right? All ages, we all need each other. In fact, um, a leader in our movement calls the nursing home a ghetto of old age. And she doesn't mean to be rude. She just means to be pointing out that's a problem. Whoever thought of putting all old people together with old people, I don't know that it was the best idea. Really, right? I, I love old people, but I don't only want to hang out with old people when I'm old. Anybody else? Who thought of that? So it is our privilege to try to get people of all ages in. Now, thankfully, the visitation rules are with us. <laughs> Isn't it funny? A year ago, I was, couldn't say that, but yay. And so now I, I have to say this before I move on. Please never look just at, let's say, the activity director, like Brittany, and say, Brittany, find the babies. Because Brittany only knows so many babies, right? And then those babies grow up fast. And now she doesn't know any babies, right? And so we have to say it to each other. Hey, Patty, know any babies? Hey, Don, you know? And then talk to your neighbor, your cousin, <laughs> whatever it is, and invite them to bring their baby. And we'll take it from there. We'll introduce. We'll make it smooth. We'll answer their questions, right? They need your babies and your babies need the older people. And then as they grow up, they need them even more, right? And then we have beautiful stories of friendship and relationship and young people maybe going into this field, right? Oh, and so that is a very short <laughs> attempt to tell a little bit about culture change. And as you can see, the more we do some of that, we will certainly be in better compliance. I'm gonna show you the regs right now. And remember, these regs are actually just minimal. And culture change helps us go beyond minimal. Now I want to bring up animals. So if you're going to live real normal life, that would include people of all ages as well as real animals, right? Did you know stroking a pet reduces blood pressure? That is so awesome. Don't we have blood pressure issues in most nursing homes? <laughs> and you never hear anyone saying that. Wouldn't it be cool to hear nurses go, you guys, maybe we should get a pet because pets reduce blood pressure. Wouldn't that be amazing? I'm kind of challenging nurses to, and it's not just them, of course, but if they represent good nursing care, right? Wouldn't it be cool if they said things like, well, has she gone outside yet, right? Did we wake her up? Duh, she's in a bad mood, right? Help her get back to bed, you know? Where's the dog? Go get the dog. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? Or try her favorite music anything, real life before meds, right? And um, check this out. One time I ran into a physician order, seriously. I wish I had, we didn't have cameras on our phones back then. And it said, Michael must have his dog with him wherever he lives. <laughs> we need more physician orders like that, don't you think? <laughs> that is awesome. And then we have many stories about birds. Um, birds, the first famous story is in Dr. Thomas's book, He's the physician that started the Eden Alternative. And he tells of a man who moved into the nursing home. Notice I didn't say was admitted. He moved into the nursing home. And unfortunately, he had the diagnosis of failure to thrive. You know what that looks like, right? They asked his permission to per put a bird in his room. He said yes. At first, the staff took care of it. But quickly, he started to take care of the bird. And you know what, guys? He got so much better. He moved out of the nursing home to assisted living. Once again, you do not hear this about Zoloft, do you? So we need more animals, we just do. And then I'm now gonna move, let's see, 
Any comments or questions about that? That's a tiny little snippet of what culture change is. And then I'm gonna go into regulations. I got a hand up, Jesse. Jesse, Jesse, you should I, be able to clap. I was trying to clap. That was meant oh, to be a clap okay, for great, the animals. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jesse. I'll you clap bet. with you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Uh, Nancy Brennan. I one thing. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Patty. Or no, Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Just for the people that are looking at bringing pets, don't forget to, like, care plan that. Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes. How and who's going to take care of them. And then we also, um, when we had a dog move in with an elder, we had to present it at elder council and get a permission from the other elders. Yeah, it's true. I, I just jumped to the fun stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. There, there's a lot more to it, but I just like to start with that. Um, since more people live there, more people need to be inquired and brought in, like Kelly said. Uh, of course, animals have to have all the proper shots and things, a care plan, think of it as their own medical record. Um, but, but, you know, we kind of do that anyway in our families. We just don't really talk that way. Uh, and then I want to ask, um, if Nancy Brennan can tell us where you're from. Hi, Nancy. Nancy, Nancy, are you there? Does anyone know Nancy? <laughs> just curious if she represents a nursing home out there in Wyoming. Nancy, can you hear me? Bummer. Okay. We're gonna move on. Here comes regs. And we're gonna start with the federal government's definition of person-centered care because it's so good. Ready? Person-centered care means to focus on the resident as the locus of control and support the resident in making their own choices and having control over their daily lives. You know what I've realized everyone? That is not a definition of care. Uh -uh. To be the locus of control and make your own choices. That's a, de that's a definition of something else. I kind of don't know what, what it is, if you could help me. To me, it represents life and living, not just care. See, care is done to you and you receive it, right? When you're in charge of your life, you don't, you know, maybe self-care, but it's not really that when you live in a nursing home, right? So love your thoughts on that. Um, and guess what? Person-centered care is not the same thing as culture change. Even culture change leaders talk like this. All they talk about is person-centered care, person-centered care. Guess what? Culture is more than just the care, right? It's, it's the physical environment, the organizational environment. It's each one of you as individuals who live and work there. And um, care is just a part of all that culture. So beware of that. And then guess what? The term person-centered was outdated even when CMS put it in here thinking that it was new. <laughs> Isn't that funny? And this was in 2016. The movement had moved on to person-directed care already, and we were moving into talking more about living. We call it self-directed living. How do you like that? Self-directed living. See, you are directing your life right now, right? I'm directing my life right now, right? Wouldn't that be great if everyone does that, no matter their their age and disabilities or what needs. All right, here comes some resident rights. Um, each nursing home, I actually do not say that F word. <laughs> if you wanna join us, we, we have fun referring to the word facility that way, only because it's really not a word that represents home or life or living. Real people don't live in facilities. You live in a home, right? And so by just changing the language and referring to the home or the community, that's another nice word, community. You know, Morningstar is a community unto itself. There's lots of people that live there, work there, come there, right? So please join us. So a nursing home must treat each resident with respect and dignity and care for each resident in a manner and in an environment that promotes maintenance or enhancement of his or her quality of life, Woo recognizing each resident's individuality. Oh, look at all those beautiful words, everyone. You could just focus on that sentence for a year, you know, draw out respect and dignity, draw out quality of life and draw out individuality. Need I say more? And then uh, look at this. This is actually a new reg. Uh, you must protect and promote the rights of the resident. Do you notice those strong words, protect and promote? Now think about why the reg didn't say that before and why it does now. And that says a lot, doesn't it? 
you know, I've done a lot of work with regs. I worked at CMS myself, but here's what I sort of hear in between the lines. They're sort of saying, hey, nursing homes, you've done a fine job of telling people their rights and posting it and giving them a copy and maybe even talking about it, you know, every month at resident council, but you really need to step it up and protect it even and promote. Isn't that wonderful? And then look at this, the resident's wishes and preferences must be considered in the exercise of rights by the representative. That is often the family member, either a legal rep or not legal, the person who speaks on their behalf. Look what it says, you family members, this is what it says, you must um, consider the resident's wishes and preferences. And if I may just say a kind caution, sometimes family members, things get a little maybe twisted. And all I mean is <laughs> just be aware of your ideas, your wishes for your mom versus your mom's wishes for herself. And I would encourage you to always try to switch your framework, not what you want, but what would my mom want? What has she always wanted? How has she talked about her diabetes? How has she lived her life with her diabetes? Am I pushing what I think she should do on her? Just be aware, all of us, that's the risk we take when we're a family member. Uh, another strong reg, you have the right as a nursing home resident to be informed of risks and benefits, both of proposed care. So sometimes we just present what you should do, right? The doctor says you should be on a restricted diet. The end, right? How many times do we say, so let's think about it. Here's the risks and here's the benefits. And guess what? There's risks and benefits to everything. A lot of people don't like restricted diets. So maybe now they don't eat and now they lose weight. And here comes those darn supplements we already talked about, right? <laughs> and nobody seems to talk about that. And then look at all these choice words. It's so good. So you have the right to be informed of risks and benefits of proposed care. And then look, of treatment and treatment alternatives or treatment options and to choose the alternative or option they prefer. Isn't that great? That, that sentence has so many choice words in it. It's, it's beautiful. And yet, do most people who live in a nursing home feel they have all that choice? <laughs> I kind of think not. And then here comes some more. They have the right to request refuse or discontinue treatment. Oh, so good. It used to say residents have the right to refuse treatment. And in a way that sounds even stronger, doesn't it? But it's stronger this way. Not only can they refuse, they can also request and they can also discontinue. <laughs> oh, so good. Now, some more choice regs under a title of self-determination, the right to choose activities and schedules including sleeping and waking times, yay, healthcare, providers of healthcare services consistent with a person's interests, assessments, and plan of care. Now let's just break it down. Of course, they have the right to choose activities that no one's forcing them to go, right? But I think the strongest part is to choose schedules. How about you? <laughs> and then including sleeping and waking, that's new and that's good. And I'm gonna come right back to that in a minute. And then look at the second bullet, the right to make choices about aspects of his or her life that are significant to them. Oh, if we had more time, like what's significant to you? Maybe that animal again is significant to you. How can we make it work with everyone and you to have your, your animal? Um, sleep is important to me. That's going to be top of my list. Anyone else? So speaking of sleep now, I want to teach you all something. Notice how that top bullet says the right to choose schedules, including sleeping and waking times. This is actually a problem. And what I mean is it's kind of too bad CMS worded it this way. So notice it's all about choice, right? That's good, right? When do you want to go to bed? When do you want to get up, right? It sounds great. Why would I be picking at it? Here's why. Because when it comes to sleep, do you realize true choice is your body decides when to wake up. Ha ha. Do any of you like to sleep? Ha ha. Anyone? Anyone? Or is it just me? I love to sleep. I do. <laughs> Thank you, Brittany. Most, you know, I'm kind of not meeting anyone that doesn't like to sleep. You know what I'm saying here? So think about this. Sleep is glorious. We love sleep. How would you guys describe a day where you don't have to set your alarm? Anybody?
I That's would straight it. heaven. Uh, Brittany? Sorry. Melissa here with me says that that's heaven. Yes, heaven. And Patty. Amazing. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I almost get giddy, you guys. Like, oh, I'm so happy I don't have to set my alarm. I'm so happy. Okay. And just think, we could be giving that gift. Heaven. We could be giving heaven on earth to every single person living in a nursing home across the world. And yet, do you realize they're some of the most sleep deprived people in the world? Why? Because we bow down to the institution and not to the person who lives there. Isn't that sad? And then think about this next problem. Who wants the job to wake people up? We have a problem with work, having enough workers in nursing homes, right? They already didn't make enough money. Then we put on a pandemic, you know, and now we're strapped for staff. And, and still the job consists of waking people up who don't want to get up. And, you know, depending on the person, depending on their waking up, startling, depending on cognition, they might hurt you. Isn't that amazing? What the heck are we doing? <laughs> somebody, somebody, somebody. So think of the benefits of being well rested. We're less depressed and anxious. We're more alert, more energy. Our immune system is better. Our, our protein synthesizes. I don't even know how that works. <laughs> you know, tissue repair, muscle growth. Our cognition is better. Our thinking is better. We don't have quote those silly behaviors. We don't call them that. But what we have traditionally called behaviors, guess what? Whose fault is it? Why do they have problematic behavior? Probably because we just woke them up. And I have story after story that it always came down to that. So of course, a better mood. Oh, I love this too, guys. If you want fewer falls, help people be well rested. And then really everything's better. So why would we wake people up? And then look at what it looks like when we do wake them up. We make them up during the night. We wake them up early in the morning, you know, and this is what it looks like. Wow, isn't that sad? It's kind of the hurry up and wait syndrome. You know, hurry up, get up, get up, get up. Hurry up, get to the dining room and then hurry up and wait. Do you realize we can't serve everyone when they get to the dining room anyway? So smart people in the culture change movement design something they call open dining. So now we start to have open dining times. We get rid of that arbitrary breakfast time. It'd be fun to ask any of you representing a nursing home, like who set the time of breakfast? <laughs> Brittany, hey, Brittany, can you unmute? Do you happen yes, to know, um, like, Brittany, who set the breakfast time in your building? Our management staff sets our breakfast time. Has, has it changed since you worked there or has it always been the no, same? No, but they're set up because we have to have the dining room open for, for to serve a meal for two hours. Yeah, we have to have so many hours in between each of our meals. And so that helps dictate that. So we pick when we're going to start breakfast and then split them up from there. Well, it kind of proves the point, right? The people who live there yeah. don't really pick the time. And then Brittany and team, I'd like you to hear this and everybody else. Okay. So when Brittany said, oh, we have to have a certain amount of time. I'm sorry, it's not on the slide. You guys can look this up. But most people have learned it as the 14 hour rule, right? Most of you have heard the 14 hour rule. And um, here's the deal. There's this one long sentence. All these regs are long sentences, right? And it goes something like this. There shall be 14 hours um, between uh, a supper time and a breakfast time. Unless, get this, it goes on and, goes on and nobody knows it. Unless. A resident group agrees and a nutritional snack is provided at bedtime, then 16 hours may elapse. <laughs> Isn't it sad we didn't learn it as the 16 hour rule? And here's another, here's another big news, everybody. So think about the supper times, okay? The open supper time, okay? And now think about the open breakfast time, okay? And from the end of supper, to the beginning of breakfast it's always within 14 hours and look what happened you are now honoring choice here's choice come eat when you want to supper choice come eat when you want to when you're ready to in 
breakfast and the nurse is now compliant with all those choice regs I just showed you more than ever before. And what kind of saddens me, everyone, is that never gets the attention. Ombudsman on the line, speak for choice in dining. Choice, quote the regs. They're supposed to have choice about things that are significant to them. Choice in schedules, see? And we even need surveyors, to be honest, if they kept, if they put choice as the number one thing rather than 14 hours, which doesn't make sense anymore, then we would all be starting to think the same way. And by the way, I get to share this with surveyors. <laughs> all right, so notice breakfast drives everything, right? So here's what happens, the better outcomes from open dining. CNAs, when they have to hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, get everyone in the dining room at this certain time, guess what? They can't give the good care they actually wanna give. And if you slow that down, if you say, hey, you'll get breakfast, don't worry. Between this time and this time, breakfast is served. It's open dining. Now CNAs can take the time to help someone brush their teeth, brush their hair, put on their lipstick. Isn't that cool? And then think about how many of us don't even eat breakfast. Maybe someone lives there that doesn't even eat breakfast. What would happen to them? You know what people usually say, like in a conference, they go, oh, they would eat breakfast. And sadly, that is how the institution works, okay? And you know what we're doing? We're teaching people learn helplessness. They learn to be helpless. They learn, well, okay, fine. If I just let them get me up, because they're gonna anyway, I go to the dining room and I eat a couple bites of toast, then I can go where? Somebody tell me. <laughs> then I can go. Back to bed. Exactly. Back to bed. Isn't that sad? So notice that's a good example of of wasted time, inefficient work, wasted money, upsetness to everyone. Isn't that something? So open dining is a great answer to honor choice, less rush, happier all around. Everything's better. And here's something cool to tell you all. Guess what? Most homes kind of have open dining already without realizing it. Notice this example. If breakfast is at seven, at seven, you know, of course, depending on how many people, let's just generalize though. Let's say it takes about an hour to get everybody finally served. Here's what you can do. Stop saying breakfast is at seven and start saying breakfast is served between seven and eight. Then I would challenge you to move on and try to grow that time. Two hours is kind of a commonality in the movement if you can try to get to a two hour window. Okay, I gotta move on. This is another beautiful reg. Residents have the right to organize and participate in resident groups. The federal reg does not use the term resident council. Now, oftentimes state regs do, that's where it comes from, but most residents have a resident council, their resident group. And then it says that you, the nursing home, must consider the views of a resident or family group. We could talk about that too, and we will actually. Um, and act promptly upon grievances and recommendations of such groups concerning issues of resident care and life in this home. So act promptly. Notice a monthly, a monthly resident council is actually not very prompt, everybody. We recommend a meeting more often. It's coming, give me a moment. And then notice it's both grievances and recommendations. I'm sure you're all doing that, but you know, it's, it's a beautiful way to honor people who live there to start asking them more and more about their ideas, their solutions to problems, their wisdom, ask for their wisdom and advice, okay? Maybe use different words. And then notice also what I have in a different color here. It's not just about care. I love how CMS actually put and life. That's a big win. So for what it's worth, you know, help us to focus on life as well as care, maybe even more a little bit than care. Now, one of the culture change practices is called a daily, okay, a community meeting. A community meeting can be monthly if you wanted to, weekly if you wanted. To be honest, you'll get the best, um, you know, bang for your buck, let's say, if you were to consider daily, I'll tell you in a minute. And then another practice that's really worthwhile thinking about is what we call neighborhood meetings. So let me talk about neighborhood first. So, you know, people live on this neighborhood, we don't call them units. 
and some people work on this neighborhood. So when there's an Aspen neighborhood meeting, it makes complete sense that these residents would come and these staff members would come. Like the nurse on Aspen neighborhood would come to Aspen neighborhood meeting, whereas the nurse would never go to resident council. Isn't that interesting? And this way you function more like a neighborhood, more like a community. And this neighborhood has different issues and, and celebrations than the next neighborhood. So that's something to consider. It works quite well. What we've found over the years, everyone, is that more residents tend to go to the neighborhood council because it has to do with their neighborhood and it tends to be a smaller meeting. And like I said, more team members come and then you really can talk about whatever needs talked about for that neighborhood. So now a daily community meeting, um, one of the top nursing homes in my experience that, that really succeeded with daily community meetings is this home um, in Denver, Parkview Care Center. Not only did they have a daily morning meeting, they also did it again in Spanish. Ah, what a commitment, right? And now think of community. This means both staff and residents, always, always together. We have a lot of resident only meetings, resident only activities. We have a lot of staff meetings, staff in services, right? And so we have to be very diligent about really making it community. And then what I've been so impressed with is this home actually brought decision making to the community, even the budget at times. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? There's a story where apparently money was, it was like maybe you know, there was some financial problems and they were starting to talk about having to cut staff. And there's a famous quote that, you know, that the residents said, please don't cut anyone. We'll go with cheaper toilet paper before we have anyone lose their job. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? You don't hear that too often. That's what communities do though. They also, this is where they test the products. Guess what? If a vendor walks in to this nursing home, and says, may I please meet with whoever, head of dining? They'll say, sorry, we do all that in our community meetings. You'll have to come back in the morning. <laughs> and then they present whatever they're trying to sell to the community. Wow, who does that? And then um, they also have a quote where the resident council president told the surveyor during survey, ready? Oh, we run this place. <laughs> what a compliment. Oh my goodness. And so then when they did daily meetings and now it's time to have the monthly resident council meeting, get ready to mute, unmute everyone. So they're doing daily meetings. They're talking about stuff every day. And you know, this is years ago, right? And they finally go, oh, time to have resident council. Here's my question, ready? What was there to talk about at resident council? Who can guess? nothing oh Brittany you got it there was nothing to talk <laughs> about everybody isn't that interesting and totally makes sense and that drove them to decide to not hold resident council and now they uh, this is their resident council this is better than resident council and when surveyors ask for the minutes they bring the stack of them and they say here you go <laughs> or how many you want to look at isn't that great so uh, another another neat thing I want to tell you about this is um, if a grievance is filled out internally at the nursing home, let's say today, the the heart of the matter, not the details, right, are brought to the community meeting the very next day. Hey, everybody, um, are you having issues with this or that? How's that going? Uh, everybody, you know, anybody know about this or that or someone else or, you know, and, and notice what's happening. They're dealing with issues in real time. <gasps> oh, that is why I'm such a fan about um, community meetings right there. And, and remember that rig? Now we're talking that is dealing with, you know, both care and life like we're supposed to uh, and in real time. Now, I probably don't have time to go into uh, language. You all know that la changing language is a big part of changing culture. So I really encourage you, become a student, challenge yourself. To be honest, I've been chatting about this for years and I'm on different calls for years 
and I'm trying to make the point to try different language and in some cases like it seems like no one's listening now that that's not to dismiss anyone I, it's just to challenge you one way to speed things up is to change your language and maybe even to say it out loud you know if, if you know you're not saying facility sometimes it pays off to, to share with whoever you're with out loud that you're purposely not saying that word <laughs> right it's sort of like calling yourself like oh oh i i'm trying not to say that f word and and oh so so in this community you know it's just something i've learned sometimes to consider saying out loud whatever it is you're kind of working on and then i do not have time to go into this but it's okay I want you all to be aware that one of another beautiful regulation, this is sprinkled throughout all the regs, is that we are supposed to um, help people living in nursing homes reach their highest practicable level of well being. Isn't that beautiful language? And the strongest place is that TAG 655 Comprehensive Person Centered Care Planning. So, did you know that each care plan must? not even should or could, <laughs> must describe the services that are to be furnished to attain or maintain the resident's highest practicable physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being. And I'll just be honest, Wyoming, that's usually never in the care plan <clears throat> identified like that. Usually it is never broken down mental as well as physical, as well as psychosocial and the reg says we're supposed to. So if all of us just start talking about this, ombudsman as well, it is in the regs. And to be honest, I also don't see surveyors citing it. I, to be honest, that's probably why it's never really happened. Isn't it too bad that sometimes we need to hear about surveyors citing things to then kick us into gear to do it. So I'm giving you the heads up. <laughs> I am gonna share this message with surveyors in your state. Um, but it's so good. Why wouldn't you want to do it? And notice, here's a hint on the word practicable. It's a different kind of word. We don't use it every day, but it, there's a word within the word and it explains everything. If a resident can walk, they're supposed to be no matter what, period. They're supposed to reach their highest practicable, even if it takes longer, even if they're slow, right? They're supposed to feed themselves if they can, even if it takes two hours, <laughs> they're supposed to. And, and you guys, your nursing home, not you personally, but your nursing home signed up to meet these regulations. So sometimes it may, you know, it may warrant bringing these issues up that we're, we're not able to meet that requirement. We need help or whatever. I have a wonderful clip. If you want to watch maybe um, the recording of this with residents, I had more time. And you'll see another person who lives in a nursing home. Actually, it's like raw footage where I tried to ask these questions. We tried to define with the person what his physical and mental and psychosocial well being is. It's super cool. And um, also, we have strong regs for quality of life. Uh, and something I've noticed about this, everyone <sighs> ready? The activities regs go to the activities team. Nursing regs, go to nursing. Dining services, go to dining. Who gets quality of life regs? Who's tending to them? Who's reading them? Whose job description are they in? Do you realize? I think this is part of the problem. We never had a place to put them. We never said, hey, you, quality of life team, make sure we're meeting these quality of life regs. So Maybe all of you could bring that up. Ombudsman, you could ask, hey, who's in charge of ensuring <laughs> the quality of life regs are being met, right? These are good things to think about. All right. And then one last reg. At the activities reg, there is something most people don't realize. It's under the intent, and it says, to create opportunities for each resident to have a meaningful life by supporting their domains of well-being. Huh, what are those? There's seven of them. I want to first show you, they actually come from the Eden Alternative. I'm giving you the website there. This is a free white paper if you'd like to learn more. But this is in the regulation. Can you believe it? We are supposed to help people find whatever means for them, identity, security, autonomy, meaning, 
connectedness, growth, and joy. I have so much joy I could explode. How about you? Joy is in the regs. Did you know that? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So I am running out of time. And let me just kind of encourage you all as people living in Wyoming, you have a culture change coalition. We're trying to move away from all those institutional things to all these normal things that we've talked about today. And we have big goals to, to try to do this in Wyoming. Um, we want to change the way long-term care is perceived and boldly go where no state has gone before. We need your help. How cool is that? We want to achieve the best quality of life and care for Wyoming residents. We have a lot of free stuff at the, the website. It's housed by Mount Pacific. And there's everything right there. And there's a lot of archived uh, recorded webinars if you wanna learn more. Um, thank you, I always wanna say thank you to the Wyoming State Survey Agency. They gave us this grant. Um, and I want to invite you to come to a very special event on March 25th. Part of the grant has been to work with five Wyoming homes. I've, I've had the privilege of just working with them monthly and they have implemented some culture change practices. Isn't that cool? They agreed to a, pr implement three, and guess what? Nobody implemented three. They all implemented more. Woo! So exciting. Yay, Brittany. And Brittany and Life Care Center Casper is one of them, although they joined midway, which is very admirable. Because they joined midway in year one, they're going to stay in year two. We also have Wyoming Retirement Basin, same story. And then the three that started in the beginning and stayed, our Star Valley, South Lincoln, and Granite. So please come join us on the 25th. You'll hear from them, not me. And I could also use your help. Year two begins in April, and I actually need three more homes, and I do not have them right now. I have one maybe. Uh, Sublet said maybe. And so I could use anyone's help to convince a nursing home, <laughs> invite them, give them my number. And then also... Here's some more things coming up. I hope you all have this calendar. Uh, Tuesday is our next conference session. It's on person-directed dining. You don't want to miss it. For sure, invite dining professionals, but come no matter who you are. And Patty, I know Max got really excited about dining. I hope she can come to that one. And then next week, we have the special sessions for activities, teams, on the 9th, the 10th is social services, the 11th is the dine, dining team. And then you see there's way more coming up. I'm trying to get done to uh, offer time for questions. We also have two big goals and that is our goals. I love having goals. We're not there yet, we could use your help. But wouldn't it be amazing in, in three years if every person who works in a Wyoming nursing home just knows about culture change to some degree. And number two, wouldn't it be amazing if people who live in your Wyoming nursing homes sleep until they wake up naturally. And that takes work, but who knows, maybe in three years, we'll be closer. So um, what questions do you all have for me? And, and if, just raise your hand if you really have one. Otherwise, what I should probably cover is here's some, some things I've learned for more family involvement. Um, if you are a family member, offer your help, offer your involvement. That's one way to make things happen. Uh, offer to be on the culture change committee. Offer to start the culture change committee. Another neat thing, I don't have a lot of time, but I want to mention it, everyone, is offer to start a dream committee. It's a really cool thing to create a community committee that helps dreams come true for the people who live there. That'll get excitement going. And then ask to start a family council. Um, whatever frequency, quarterly is pretty common. Just start to create a forum to talk about stuff, to communicate stuff. May, um, if the nursing home's smart, they'll give you decision-making opportunity. Like if you come to the family council, you can help decide on blah, 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 you know? Um, also maybe offer education. Sometimes that is fitting for families. And families, you could ask for that. And I think the neat thing is let it be a support group kind of, of a group. It's kind of hard to have someone you love live in a nursing home. Why not support each other, give each other ideas? 
Uh, a book I'd like to recommend to family members, check this out, is called Forget Memory. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Forget it. You guys, we put too much emphasis on whether or not we remember things. Uh, a gentleman, a, a husband in this book says, I just realized that I wasted three years of my life and my wife's life asking the whole time. Don't you remember? We went to Hawaii. Don't you remember? Oh, I just brought you that. Don't you remember? You just had breakfast. Don't you remember? Isn't that terrible, guys? Do any of you forget things? I know I do. And there's this weird thing about it when someone calls you on it, right? I want to be defensive. Like, oh, of course I remember. And then I'm lying. So now I'm lying. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. We force each other to feel bad about forgetting. It forces us to lie. What is happening? So the point is, how did we come to view memory as the center of our identity? That's not our identity. So help this person's identity to flourish and don't worry about whether they remember or not. Isn't that beautiful? And, and she also uh, suggests just live life together. Family members, don't go for a visit. Isn't that interesting? No, no, no. Don't go to pay a visit. You know, think about it. Sometimes it kind of looks like the family member might be looking at their watch, looking, you know, and then they're like, well, well, mom, I got to go. You know, there's no offense, but, but it's kind of hard sometimes. And maybe we could help create life, live life together. Don't just pay a visit. Nursing homes, the more you create outdoor areas, you know, <laughs> how about playgrounds for children? How about a coffee bar? See, make it enticing for people to come and live life together, not just pay a visit. And family members, we need your help to help us learn this person. We need you to give us more and more and more and more detail. We are realizing all of our forms fail us and we need your help. Help me to know your mom more. Think of every single little detail you can ever think of. And the more details we have, everyone, the deeper we can go, the better we can serve them. Ta-da, we did it. Any question, comment, idea, anybody? Uh, Carmen, this is yes. Patty. Yes. I would like to encourage um, the facilities and, and family members um, to do the family council meeting and our ombudsman will help provide that information. Um, we can't attend or we can't set up the meeting, but we can provide lots of, in, uh, of information and support. We only have one facility in the state of Wyoming who just started a family council. It has, they haven't even had their first one yet. So I would really like to encourage family members to check into that. And, and again, um, the regional ombudsman and myself can help with that. Perfect. Thanks, Patty. And Patty, Patty. Yes, ma'am. You do not need to say we cannot attend. That is not true. You could oh, attend if they invited correct. you, right? You're correct. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Perfect. And they might very Patty. well want you. Yeah. Go ahead, Brittany. Patty, uh, do you have an email so I can email you? Because I um, am looking at starting our culture change task force for my community members and their families to be in with, with our staff, but it would be really cool. I would really like to start a family council um, as well. That sounds like it would be super beneficial. Uh, hey, Brittany and Patty, I'll introduce you guys over email. Perfect, okay, thank great. you, Carmen. Mm -hmm. Sure. Anybody, anything else? Don, family um, member. Um, mm -hmm. I've, well, no, I've got a, I've been putting together a presentation on resident rights. And I was wondering if I could talk with you about it, maybe oh, of course. run some things by you. Of course. Email? Yep, you got it, I think, already, don't you? My email? If not, ask Patty for it, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Patty doesn't share these things usually. Oh, Patty. <laughs> We're just kidding. Don is a jokester. <laughs> yes, um, he is. <laughs> is, there, is there like a, a form to fill out about our satisfaction? <laughs> there should be, huh? If the coordinator had put one together, which she did not. Um, actually, Don, thank you for asking that. You guys, I'm, I'll, I'll cut this out of the recording, but could I ask each one of you, you know how Wyoming tends to do, um, what was your knowledge before this thing? And what mm -hmm. was your knowledge after one to five? Would each of you give me your numbers before and after? Yep. Real, real quick, if you don't mind, Don, 
How about you? Knowledge before, like an it's like your yep. skill, like one to or zero to five. Yep. Um, before it was like a three, and now it's a five. Perfect, Brittany. <laughs> Uh, before I'd say it was a three and now it's like a four. Okay. Uh, or like Jesse. a two and a four. Okay. Got it. Jesse, if you can talk, Jill. I'd say the same three before five now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. This is Jill. I'm on board with that too. Thank you. And Patty. Yeah, I'm about a three and a five. I was really impressed with um, all the regulations that that was quoted. Great. And uh, Nancy, are you there? Nancy, Nancy. <laughs> we never met Nancy. And then someone's on the phone. Who, who's on the phone, please? And here's a chat box, too. Aha. Um, okay. Anything else? You know, I'm sorry, Don. What could I do better, guys? I'm, tell me. You can serve <laughs> <No>. snacks. <laughs> He's so funny. I oh, like that one. Oh, Don. Okay, I'll put that down. Serve and back. Including malts. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, Patty, that is hilarious. And malt? bacon. Smoothies. Bacon cheeseburgers, please. Oh, my goodness. You guys are hilarious. Malt smoothies and shakes. Even bacon. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so funny. Uh, and anything else? Anybody? Anything at all? All right. I don't think there's you know anything what? you could do to yeah. improve it, Carmen. I think okay. I think they're really good. Thank you so much, Don. You know, at the beginning when I was talking about caring for my mom, you know? Yeah. And like getting her groceries and all that stuff. Yeah. And I said, but the most important part is I provide emotional support. Oh, yes. And I see so many people over there that are, they can't go anywhere. They're in a wheelchair and no one comes to visit them. Yes. You know, it's awful. I mean, loneliness is a terrible thing. No. You know? Yes. Um, Don, so here I, I am going door to door yeah. every day. Good. <laughs> no. You mean like visiting other people? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, guess what, Don? You're bringing up a good point. We all need to do something, don't we? Yeah. And maybe spread it. Churches, youth group, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, yep. right? Yep. Um, Jesse's saying I'm a huge proponent for preschools and long-term care centers. Me too. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah, a big thing. 4-H yeah, 4-H, yes. They come in all the time. Yeah, think of high schoolers who need community service. Think of you guys homeschoolers. We homeschooled. They have, they're in charge of their schedule and they want to serve others. Find the homeschool group in your community. You know, please, everybody do something. Good idea. Yeah, good. Okay, well. You're still you smart, are... Carmen. Oh, Don, it's because I know you. <laughs> 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 and Brittany and Patty and Jesse and Joe. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll let y'all go. This has been marvelous. Thank you so much. Thanks, Carmen. See you, see you on the next Thank one. Thank you, Carmen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.